As I said at the White House, I feel that a great many Americans are confused about Vietnam. It hasn't been explained as thoroughly as it should be as to what our real position is there. And to a great extent, because of this confusion, lack of understanding, lack of communication, they take it out and, and try to express themselves as best they can by doing something delinquent, maybe. Can you give us your, uh, your reasons for why we should or should not be in Vietnam? I am not a political person. I'm not expert enough to give you a reason as to why we should or should not be in Vietnam. But as I said, I feel the people of my country are confused, and so am I. What you just saw was a 1968 interview centered around the famous actress and singer Eartha Kitt. She was speaking on an incident that would become one of the most controversial moments in her career. Earlier that same year, Eartha Kitt was invited to a luncheon at the White House to discuss juvenile delinquency in America. When it came time for her to speak, Kitt told the First Lady, Lady Bird Johnson, the following. You send the best of this country off to be shot and maimed. They rebel in the street. They will take pot and they will get high. They don't want to go to school because they're going to be snatched off from their mothers to be shot in Vietnam. Following these comments, Eartha Kitt was blacklisted from the United States entertainment industry and she would not return for another 10 years. So when I raised my hand and told Mrs. Johnson what those boys had told me and also how I felt about our involvement in Vietnam, it seems that within two hours, I was out of work in the United States, according to my dossier that was given to me, not just a, well, not the whole thing, it was just a smidgen that said um, that I was on the CIA list in the United States of America. To speak out honestly about war, oppression, or injustice is often seen as unpatriotic and an act of rebellion by the United States government. This is also why the most visible people among us, celebrities, are hesitant to speak up. It could potentially cause them their careers. To many people in the entertainment industry, there's an expectation that celebrities are meant to be seen and not heard. This is Sasheen Littlefeather, an actress and activist for the Native American people. In 1973, she accepted, or rather refused to accept, an Oscar award on behalf of Marlon Brando. After declining to hold the reward, she stood on stage in front of a large live audience of members of the entertainment industry and on live television and stated the following. Hello, my name is Sasheen Littlefeather. I am Apache and I am president of the National Native American Affirmative Image Committee. I'm representing Marlon Brando this evening, and he has asked me to tell you in a very long speech that he very regretfully cannot accept this very generous award. And the reasons for this being are the treatment of American Indians today by the film industry and on television in movie reruns, and also with recent happenings at Wounded Knee. I beg at this time I have not intruded upon this evening, and that we will in the future, our hearts and our understandings will meet with love and generosity. Thank you on behalf of Marlon Brando. During this, Shasheen was met with a mixture of both booze and applause. Her short acting career ended with that speech, while Marlon Brando continued to have a relatively unaffected and successful career. There is some speculation and claims, however, that Sachin Littlefeather was not of Apache descent, nor was she Native American, claims she denied. What is true, however, is that she spoke up for the mistreatment of people she felt deserved better and that she spent the majority of her life doing activist work for the Native community. In 2022, almost 50 years after her Oscar speech, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences gave Sachin a long overdue apology. She died later that same year. Today, we can look back on both of those situations with Eartha Kitt and Sachin Littlefeather and know that the treatment they endured was unwarranted. Eartha Kitt was one of many Americans who made remarks that seemed to be opposing U.S. involvement in Vietnam and Sachin Littlefeather's call out about the treatment of Native American people in the film industry is still relevant today.
in the modern day, people often state disappointment and disbelief at the actions of people who silenced and harassed those who spoke up against discrimination. But as we know, history often repeats itself. Throughout history and still today, the entertainment industry has aided in the silencing of those who work for them. Oddly enough, there's no shortage of TV shows, movies, or music that have controversial or political topics. The question is, why does the entertainment industry go out of its way to fire or blacklist people who talk about war, oppression, or topics of injustice only to make media on the same topics? The answer is simple, money. Whether or not people realize it, the TV shows, music, and movies we consume affect our personal beliefs and our perspective of the world. Some of the media we consume can be educational, inspirational, and also devastating at times. Overall, it has a big impact on our cultural norms and our moral beliefs. These forms of entertainment often reflect the values of our society. Movies like The Black Panther, Hidden Figures, Selma, 12 Years a Slave, all act as reflections of black history, black culture, or the celebration of black people. Media like Paris is Burning, Moonlight, RuPaul's Drag Race, and Pose all exist as pieces of work that have added to the cultural and social movement for the LGBT community in the United States. With that being said, there are examples of media that exist that reflect the parts of our society that aren't worth celebrating, but still need to be spoken about as they, just like the entertainment I previously mentioned, are also true reflections of our society. The entertainment industry had a value estimated at $2.2 trillion as of 2022. As we reflect on the media to be mentioned in the rest of this video, pay attention to the parallels to the world in which we now live and how these movies either either aided in or profited off of the discrimination of marginalized people. This first movie changed the film industry dramatically. It had several firsts as the first film to have a continuous running time of three hours when most films at the time were around 10 minutes. It had a crew of several thousand people and the camera work was innovative at the time. It also became the first film to be screened at the White House and it grossed around $18 million. Movies of today that could compare with that type of reception would be on the level of Titanic, Avatar, or Avengers Endgame. This movie was also one of the most controversial and racist films in American history. Birth of a Nation was a 1915 film directed by D.W. Griffith. The film was adapted from the 1905 novel and play called The Klansman. Despite sparking innovation within the film industry, this movie would lead to the real-life discrimination and the amplification of hatred for Black Americans. The three-hour film was about the Civil War and reconstruction of the Southern states and the newly freed Black people who were former slaves. The movie depicted the Ku Klux Klan as saviors of the South and depicted black people as immoral and intellectually inferior. It also depicted black men as predators of white women. Dick Lair, author of The Birth of a Nation, how a legendary filmmaker and a crusading editor reignited America's Civil War, said in an NPR interview, Griffith portrayed emancipated slaves as heathens, as unworthy of being free, as uncivilized, as primarily concerned with passing laws so they could marry white women and prey on them. Griffith thought he was, in a way, reporting history about the Civil War and Reconstruction, and it was widely accepted at the time, which has been completely debunked since, that Reconstruction was a disaster and that former slaves were some kind of lower form of life. The NAACP protested the film, but did not have much impact due to its overwhelming popularity. Racial tensions were amplified after the release of this film, and across the nation, white people would show up to screenings dressed up in Confederate uniforms. And as part of promotion for the film, horsemen in white robes were sent to ride through New York City. This film had reignited the KKK, who until then had mainly remained inactive since the 1870s. The reigniting of the KKK led to the real life lynching of black people all around the United States. The impact of this movie did several things to the perspectives and held values of Americans. It first reflected the real beliefs of the creators of this film, beliefs many other white Americans held. It also made white Americans feel safe enough to openly harass and attack black Americans without prosecution. The stereotypes and false narratives created about black people in this film were accepted as fact. Shortly after the release of this film, an African-American writer, James Weldon, wrote about the negative impact the movie would have and how its impact would surpass that of its source material. He said, 
The Klansmen did us much injury as a book, but most of its readers were those already prejudiced against us. It did us more injury as a play, but a great deal of what it attempted to tell could not be represented on the stage. Made into a moving picture play, it can do us incalculable harm. Still used to teach film students today, this movie had a lasting impact on the film industry, although many will never truly grasp just how much this film has contributed to racist ideology. On pieces of media that are generally political while also having an enormous impact on American culture, another incredibly impactful show comes to mind. This show is not a movie, but rather a musical, a musical that is widely popular today and enjoyed by many. It's a standout on Broadway for its wonderful production and award-winning soundtrack. It also has allowed for the opportunity for more people of color to have roles on Broadway. This musical also amplifies and glamorizes the lives and the legacies of this nation's founding fathers. The Hamilton musical is described by its creator, Lin-Manuel Miranda, as America then told by America now. Hamilton is a nearly three hour long musical focused on the life of Alexander Hamilton, based on the 2004 biography by Ron Chernow. The musical was a breakout hit and is one of the highest grossing shows. Between the Broadway shows, US and UK tours, the musical movie, and other sources of revenue, this show has generated over $800 million. There are varying critiques of Hamilton, many regarded as a transformative work, and others as a misinterpretation of history. The founding fathers of this country were not the kind of people who should be uplifted, call them plantation owners, colonizers, racists, and land stealers, it's all true. And to have people of color portraying them on stage is both ironic and uncomfortable. Still, Hamilton is one of the most popular musicals to date. Part of the reason it is so popular is the fact that the cast is diverse, contrary to the people they portray. But does the founding fathers being portrayed by people of color make the audience believe that they weren't all that bad? Rutgers professor Lyra de Montero stated her own opinion of the show in an article titled How to Love Problematic Pulp Culture. She openly admits to loving aspects of Hamilton, but does not shy away from critiquing it. She states that we have a cultural resistance to nuance, our need for things to be black or white, good or bad, right or wrong. In this case, Hamilton was either liberatory and revolutionary and racially subversive, or it was evil and bad and should never have been made, much less performed, much less lauded. Towards the end of her article, she states, the truth is that Hamilton is both a piece of art that troubles me deeply and a piece of art that sustains me, that gives me life. There is a cultural significance to Hamilton, but it also is a piece of work that aids in positioning the Founding Fathers as heroes, despite the harm that they cause to Indigenous and Black people. Another piece of media, or rather, several pieces of media that has a fan base and influence even much bigger than Hamilton, is the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Throughout and beyond the fan base, you'll hear many criticisms of Marvel films, such as Marvel is too woke, or Marvel is not diverse enough, Marvel movies aren't as good as the comics, or there are too many Marvel movies and they need to stop. One you'll hear every once in a while is that Marvel is military propaganda. When you look at the storyline of many Marvel films, there are many references to the US military. Heroes who are created by the military, heroes who manufacture weapons for the military, and even an intelligence agency and security organization called SHIELD who protects the US and the world from threats with their superheroes. This isn't too surprising when you consider that the Marvel Cinematic Universe is just that, a universe. There are thousands of comics, TV shows, and movies that have stories about nearly everything, including the US military. But the claims of propaganda are stronger when you look at the relationship Marvel has with the real US military. As it turns out, several Marvel movies are approved and supported by the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense has a long relationship with Hollywood. For several decades, it has worked with filmmakers and provided them with assets for their films. Why does the Department of Defense work with Hollywood filmmakers? According to them, the reason is twofold. To accurately depict military stories and to make sure sensitive information isn't disclosed. Let's break down this relationship. Filmmakers choose to create a movie that has portrayals or references to the US military or has military equipment. They decide they want to use real military equipment and to film on military locations. In order to do that, they reach out to the DOD. 
After receiving a request, the DOD reads the script. Why? Because the use of the equipment is only allowed if the military is portrayed in a positive or accurate light, according to their standards. Movies approved and co-scripted by the DOD are not only limited to ones about the military. Obvious ones like Air Force One, Iron Man, Top Gun, and Top Gun Maverick have all been approved by the military. But this also includes movies you wouldn't immediately think of, like I Am Legend, Indiana Jones, and Silence of the Lambs. Of the several Marvel movies that have been approved by the DoD, there's one that stands out as particularly troubling, not simply because of the partnership, but because of the storyline and the irony of the movie's message. The year is 2008, and Iron Man is an instant hit. It is the story of Tony Stark, the billionaire playboy and owner of Stark Industries, a technology and defense company that manufactures weapons for the U.S. military. On a visit to Afghanistan, Stark demonstrated his newest weapon called the Jericho. Following this, he is attacked and kidnapped by the terrorist group called the Ten Rings. Upon awakening in captivity, Tony discovers that his life has been saved by a captive doctor named Yinsen. Stark quickly realizes to his surprise that the weapons his company created were in the hands of this group. At the request, Stark and Yinsen pretend to construct a Jericho missile for the Ten Rings. In reality, they created what would become the first Iron Man suit. With this suit, Stark escapes captivity after witnessing Yinsen's death and final words telling Tony not to waste his life. When he returns to U.S. soil, Stark and announces that he's going to stop manufacturing weapons to the surprise of millions. He develops more Iron Man suits and by the end of the film, he ends the sale and distribution of his weaponry in both Afghanistan and to the US military. Despite this being a movie that sparked the love for the MCU and Iron Man being a popular character, the idea of this movie being approved and backed by the US military is conflicting simply because Tony Stark is quite literally a war profiteer. Because we know that many of the weapons and equipment seen in this film come directly from the U.S. military, we have to wonder if the same companies who manufactured them are also the ones who benefit most from war. Like Stark Industries, many U.S. defense companies make billions from the creation of weapons. Unlike Tony Stark, no billionaire head of these companies will have a change of heart and end their manufacturing for the greater benefit of humanity. Of the top 100 defense companies of 2023, 51 are U.S.-based companies and the top three had a combined revenue of almost $170 billion in 2022. One of the other reasons why the DOD would want to make deals with Marvel movies like Iron Man is that it sets up the perfect advertisement for people to join the military. In addition, it also acts as marketing for the real life companies who manufacture for the US military. If Iron Man and many other Marvel films act as propaganda for the military, consider what other ideas are presented to us. What kind of people do we see in these films? Which ones are presented as the heroes and which ones are presented as the villains? And it's not just Marvel, Hamilton, The Birth of a Nation, and millions of other pieces of media exist to entertain us. This media also exists to influence us for better or worse. Thank you all for watching. One of the reasons I wanted to make this video is to talk about the importance of thinking critically about the media we consume. During a time when many people are coming back to the conversation of cancel culture, it often feels as if some people are against the idea of offering critique of anything, especially if it's well liked. Thinking about things deeply and asking the question, why, is important. These shows and movies we consume often take months and even years to create. The opinions and ideas of thousands of people are woven into these stories, and there's no shame in challenging what is presented to us.